ahead today on America Talks Live. I want to begin, though, uh, with the war in the White House. So Lieutenant General H.R. McMaster, who succeeded Flynn and has been trying to push Flynn loyalists out of the council since he took the role. Some say this is McMaster winning out over Bannon. Steve Bannon gets knocked out. There could be damage to President Trump. Trump is thinking about sending National Security Advisor H.R. McMaster back to Afghanistan. This is the longest war now in American history. Can anyone figure out a way to win there? President Trump pushing this new merit-based immigration system. Stephen Miller really getting into it with CNN's White House reporter about the immigration policy. Jim, that is one of the most outrageous, insulting, ignorant, and foolish things you've ever said. It doesn't have a chance of going anywhere, especially um, in the Senate. All that and more next on America Talks Live. Happy Friday Eve and welcome to America Talks Live. I'm your host, Miranda Khan. While a war may be waging in the White House, the real battle in Afghanistan continues. We'll talk about that with our panel. We've got Larry Clayman and Andrea Kay standing by. But first, let's talk about the feud that's possibly playing out between members of President Trump's administration. The Weekly Standard reports that National Security Advisor H.R. McMaster and Steve Bannon have gone to the mattresses after McMaster removed three national security aides who were loyal to Trump's chief strategist. But Bannon allies are fighting back. Today, radio host Laura Ingram tweeted a New York Times article claiming McMaster is breaking with the administration on views on Islam. And blogger Mike Cernovich has also been tweeting using the hashtag McMaster facts to bash the national security advisor. And that's where we want to welcome in today's panel. Joining us now, we have GOP strategist Andrea Kay. She is also the host of The Andrea Kay Show. And we're pleased to have with us former federal prosecutor Larry Clayman. He's also the founder of Freedom Watch. Thank you both for joining us today. You're welcome. Hey, guys. Good to be with you. So the Weekly Standard also reports that Steve Bannon has been thinking about leaving the White House for some time, especially following the ouster of his friend, Heinz Priebus. Andrea, do you think there is any truth to any of these rumors? You know what, I'm glad you used the word rumor there because, you know, this is starting to remind me back of my old sorority days, you know, where, you know, there was all these shakeups among, you know, the different leaders in the sorority and the sorority girls not really knowing who really was their friend and who wasn't. You know, I mean, it's really a difficult position President Trump took from the beginning because it was clear from the beginning, beginning that while many people that he thought or he thought he was surrounded by friends in the White House or at least people friendly to his administration because, you know, he wasn't won the Republican Party ticket, and he surrounded himself with Republicans only to have continual leaks. It even continues today. And it's got to be really difficult for him to know who's a friend or who a foe is. He's got a lot of Judases around him, to use mixed metaphors. So then it makes it, if he doesn't know, it makes it even hard for us to know who really there has his back and really the people's back. He was elected to put forth his agenda. And even if McMaster's varies a little bit from where Trump was uh, on his stand on Islam, the bottom line is these people around him are supposed to be supporting him and getting his agenda passed. And if Trump supports these changes McMaster's is making, then I'm go going to support that. Larry, I don't know if you were in a fraternity and can make some of the same comparisons that our lovely Andrea did yeah. right there. But, you know, I have to say, and I want to say these are rumors because, again, that's all they are right now. But as you may recall, there were rumors about Priebus being ousted and Sean Spicer. And guess what? they're gone. So what do you think? Well, you know, when I was at Duke University, I was in a fraternity uh, Phi Gamma Tau that was non-selective. In other words, anybody that wanted to be in it could be in it. I mean, I believe in openness. And it's good to have divergent views in the White House. I hope that Steve Bannon does not leave. I believe he's extremely important to President Trump. He is a true populist. He's someone who's taken a very strong stand on certain issues. And McMaster is an establishment figure. And the two of them, I agree with Andrea, need to work together in furtherance of the mission of, of the president. You know, just today there are more leaks about conversations the president had with the president of Mexico and the president of Australia. I mean, this is outrageous. These people should be going to jail. 
How can the president have any conversation when the intelligence agencies are surveilling him all the time? And of course, you know, we've been active in that regard. So everybody needs to pull together now, as Benjamin Franklin said, either we all hang together or we'll hang separately. Well, also floating out there after McMaster acts, the three A's that were supposedly loyal to Bannon and that sort of rumors that he may actually be on his way out the door. Now, the New York Times is reporting that McMaster could be headed to Afghanistan to stabilize the war effort there. It claims President Trump is considering moving CIA director Mike Pompeo to now take over as a national at the National Security Council. Uh, Andrea, do you think that would be a wise move for the president to make? Oh, absolutely, because I think, uh, you know, the, Laura Ingram, I share Laura Ingram's concerns with McMaster's in terms of his stance on Islam. Again, as I said before, he's not, he doesn't set policy, but I would certainly prefer someone at the head of the NSC like uh, Mike Pompeo, who actually understands the enemy and isn't trying to take us back to the days like McMaster said, where he, McMaster's didn't want to use the term radical Islamic terrorism. Well, you know, it's kind of hard to separate uh, Islamic uh, terrorism from, you know, is Islam from the Islamic terrorism that's happening. And so I, I certainly think uh, Pompeo would be better in that position. And, and we certainly absolutely need to get uh, generals back on the ground and get what's get Afghanistan back under control if it's possible, if it's not too late. Larry, what do you think? You know, I, usually, well, I usually agree with Andrea. This is the one area so far we've been on together a number of times that I disagree. I don't think Mike Pompeo, honestly, is the person for the job. He's an individual who believes that this mass surveillance on everybody without probable cause, without any connection of, uh, to terrorism, is okay. And he, you know, trashes Snowden. Snowden's not the greatest guy in the world. He's in Russia, but he did us a real service. And frankly, I've got to be honest, I don't think Pompeo's all that bright. I've watched him uh, function. He's a congressman. He's a, he's a poll. Uh, I don't think he's up for the job. And he's actually a defendant in a lawsuit of mine that I brought against Comey, the intelligence agencies, and him as the head of the CIA for illegally surveilling people. I think the guy's the worst pick that Trump made with regard to the cabinet. Wow, okay, so you don't even support him being director of the CIA. Okay, let alone this idea. No, I'd like, I'd like, to, see him, I'd like to see him go on with that too. He has no respect for the Constitution, as far as I'm concerned. And that's, that's my mild opinion. All right, well, not that mild, uh, but let's get, uh, let's get your opinions about something else. I want to talk more about that war in Afghanistan. President Trump claims the U.S. is losing, this according to NBC News. It reports that Trump is impatient uh, with his military advisors and is even considering firing the top commander of U.S. forces, General John Nicholson. Now, last month, Trump reportedly complained about NATO allies during a two-hour meeting in the Situation Room. NBC News also claims that he was asked whether the U.S. could obtain part of Afghanistan's mineral wealth. President Trump wasn't the only person uh, who was frustrated after leaving that meeting, reportedly. Uh, NBC News uh, says that Defense Secretary James Mattis was visibly upset after President Trump left without making a decision. Now, he reportedly told the president that the Taliban was gaining ground against American forces because Trump didn't give them a strategy for winning the war. Andrea, Mattis's words reportedly come after Trump complained that he had given the military authority months earlier to make advances on the Taliban. So who's to blame here? The president or the commander of U.S. forces in Afghanistan? Or do they both share part of the blame? And again, if this NBC report is true. Well, you know, it, again, here we've got a he said, he said story going on here. I think if the, the what Trump said on the campaign trail and what he said after he took office is that he was giving uh, the commanders uh, on the ground and the, and the generals on the ground and the military, uh, the, the, the commanders in his uh, joint chiefs, as well as the boots on the ground, those people there, the authority to do what they needed to do to win this war. And we saw the Moab happen, right? That supposedly came about because he gave the decision making to the men in the field. Um, and so, you know, I, I, I'm a little disturbed to hear that it's now being characterized that he's not able to make a decision. However, let's say that's true, then, you know, shame on President Trump for that, because, you know, we've had 
uh, under President Obama, we had more U.S. heroes lose their lives over there fighting for this country. Uh, we didn't have the, the count every day with the mainstream media like we did when President Bush uh, led our troops over there. But uh, the rules of engagement needed to be changed immediately under President Trump to protect American lives. That supposedly changed. He supposedly told the generals and everybody in the chain of command to do what they needed to do to win this war. Larry? Uh, Andrew is absolutely right. I mean, we have a number of clients, families of fallen heroes with Extortion 17. You can see that at freedomwatchusa.org, who, because of those rules of engagement, 30 servicemen, 22 special ops, some SEAL Team 6, SEAL Team 6 went down in the Tangi Valley three months after Obama, excuse me, Osama bin Laden, that was the Freudian slip, was killed. And we never got answers to what happened. And it could have been avoided because of those rules of engagement. The military's covered it up. But I will say this as well. I personally don't think the war in Afghanistan is winnable. It wasn't winnable when the Russians moved in there many years ago during the Carter administration. I think it's a waste of American life. I think, frankly, we should get out of there uh, and cut our losses because there's no way that that government, which is totally corrupt in Kabul, the Afghan government, is ever going to be able to take over and we're going to be there for the rest of our collective lives, defending people who don't even want to be defended. They want mm -hmm. to do their own thing. So let them do their own thing with the Taliban and see how it works out. That's my view. A Andrea, I want to get your thoughts on that I, and what he had to say about the, the war in Afghanistan. You heard Larry say that we should get out. It's unwinnable. What do you think? I, well, um, I, I think that it depends on what uh, the definition of a win is. If the definition of a win is just to wipe out all the Taliban and start dropping some bombs and wipe them out and then get our people out. If the definition of a win is to install democracy over there, which is what you know President Bush was all about, uh, like in Iraq, um, to me, you know, I think we need to pull out because the President Trump said he's not into this nation building thing. I worked on a documentary years ago exploring the idea. I called it was called Baking Apple Pies, exploring the idea of can we defeat terrorism by baking apple pies, installing democracy around the world, and doing nation building? And no, it does not work. So maybe that's what um, General Mattis was frustrated with in terms of uh, the mission from President Trump. You know, it, define the mission, define what a win is. It should be defeating and killing and destroying our enemy, and that and that alone, not build, building schools and all this other stuff involved. Um, so if the mission is to destroy them, then do it and get out. Larry, you were going to say? Andrew's right. I mean, there's there's so much confusion over there, and the GIs don't feel like they're accomplishing any purpose. It's no wonder that one GI, one serviceman a day, is committing suicide coming back right. to this country. They can't figure out why they're there, and they're getting maimed and killed. And and this is a disgrace. If President Trump's right in trying to either do something uh, affirmative or, or, or get out. Yes. And, and if I piggyback one more thing on what uh, on what uh, John Clayman said in regards to ex extortion 17, first of all, the rules of engagement didn't just leave those those 30 heroes dead, but you know that those rules of engagement left a lot more. However, the investigation that was done on that was shady. There was a lot of misreporting that was done. Um, it wasn't just the rules of engagement on the ground. There was eyes in the skies that were told not to protect our heroes in that helicopter. And that investigation needs to be reopened. Just because Jason Chaffetz left doesn't mean that the investigation should be left there. Bigger than Benghazi. Well, thank you, thank you, Andrew. Jason Chaffetz covered that up. In fact, there's an inspector general investigation at the Department of Defense about that right now that we started. All right, uh, we've got to leave it there for right now. Uh, interesting insight from both of you. Please stick around. We still have a lot more to talk about, including the president's continuing battle with the mainstream be media. Easy for me to say. I can't even spit it out. Speaking of battles, President Trump's plans to reform immigration sparked a war of words between the White House and the CNN reporter. We're going to talk more about that coming up. Welcome back to America Talks Live. We want to bring back our political panel. Joining us once again, Andrea Kay and Larry Clayman. Thank you both for sticking around. Uh, the Anthony Scary. <laughs> nice to have you. The Anthony Scaramucci Show, once thought to be canceled. Guess what? It may be back on the air. According to CNN, he and Bill Shine will hold an online event tomorrow to directly address President Trump's base of supporters. Scaramucci was fired as the White House communications director after he ran it about his co-workers to a reporter for New York Magazine. Now, Scaramucci, Scaramucci also reportedly told CNN that he thought his time at the White House was a success. Andrea, do you agree with that assessment? 
<laughs> I, I I can't help but laugh. He's saying it was a success. He didn't even get 15 minutes of fame. That's why he's like desperate to come out and keep it going with this, you know, this um, event. What is he going to do? Pay per view? I mean, come on, scary movie. Look, when he was first announced, I thought, great, this guy looks like he could run a family. Then we realized he was more Sunny than he was Michael, and he had to be Fredo. Okay, and what happened to Fredo? Fredo was gone permanently, and that's what needs to happen to Scaramucci. Ooh, Larry, uh, what do you think he hopes to achieve then by having this online event? Well, he's trying to recreate some kind of credibility, which, you know, at this point he really doesn't have any. I mean, you can't be communications director in the White House and spew forth profanities like we heard, you know, in the last few weeks. It, it's ridiculous. And then not showing up. I don't care if you're estranged from your wife or not. Not trying to show up when you're when your infant is born, I mean, that's really low class. And, and that's what this guy is. He's simply low class. Now, he's trying to resurrect his reputation, as bad as it is, with Bill Shine, who was the number two at Fox News under Roger Ailes. And I don't think this is the way to do it. Bill Shine uh, is someone who, along with Roger Ailes, boycotted a lot of people from that network, threw people off, like Matt Drudge, uh, others. Uh, he's not someone, frankly, I think you, you should throw your lot in with given the fact that scaramucci has been fired, it's not going to resurrect his reputation. I don't think you both are going to be tuning in. All right. Uh, Andrea Kay, thanks so much for joining us today. Larry, please stick around. We'll talk more after the break. Well, let's talk about uh, President Trump's uh, seems to be never-ending battle with the media, at least mainstream media. Yesterday, his senior policy advisor, Stephen Miller, went toe-to-toe -to -toe with CNN's reporters, Jim Acosta. Here's a look at that exchange. What the president is proposing here does not sound like it's in keeping with American tradition when it comes to immigration. The Statue of Liberty says, give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses, you're in to breathe free. It doesn't say anything about speaking English or being able to uh, compu be a computer programmer. This whole notion of, well, they could learn, you know, they have to learn English before they get to the United States. Are we just going to bring in people from Great Britain and Australia? Jim, it's actually, I have to honestly say, I am shocked at your statement that you think that only people from Great Britain and Australia would know English. It's actually, it reveals your cosmopolitan uh, bias to a shocking degree that in your mind, no, this is an amazing, this is an amazing moment. This is an amazing moment that you think only people from Great Britain or Australia would speak English is so insulting to millions of hardworking immigrants who do speak English from all over the world. Jim, have you honestly, Jim, have you honestly never met a, an immigrant from another country who speaks English outside of Great Britain and Australia? Is that your personal experience? Of course there are people who come But that's not what you said. And it shows, it shows your cosmopolitan bias. And I just want to say... Engineer the racial and ethnic flow of people into this country. Jim, that is one of the most outrageous, insulting, ignorant, and foolish things you've ever said. And for you, that's still a really... The, the notion that you think that this is a racist bill is so wrong and so insulting that people who have hurt the most with the policy you're advocating are immigrant workers and minority workers and African-American workers and Hispanic workers. Ouch. All right, now that you're all up to date, let's bring back Larry Clayman. He's a former federal prosecutor and the founder, again, of Freedom Watch. Larry, thanks for sticking around. Hey, Miranda. Good to mm. see you. Wow. Those were some fireworks. So uh, did anyone walk away, as a prosecutor, you should know this, did anybody walk away with the upper hand in this heated exchange? No, they didn't. I think they were both wrong, actually. First of all, you know, my grandparents came here from the Ukraine. They thought it was Russia. They were a bit confused after the Russian Revolution, Poland, Lithuania, and they couldn't speak English. They learned English. They made an effort to learn English. And in fact, my grandfather, even throughout his life, had some difficulty reading. I used to read the Talmud for him sometimes. Mm. And th the reality here is, is that uh, they should have to make a pledge, I believe, uh, immigrants, if they want to come here, that they will learn English within a certain period of time and adhere to that pledge. And perhaps there should be a consequence for not doing it. We do need a homogeneous society. We need to have people assimilate. We can't become like Europe, where you have certain factions that are broken away from the rest of Western civilization. But I don't think that we should have a prerequisite to come here having spoken English in advance, particularly since a lot of people come here for political asylum. Look at the people from Cuba, for instance, or certain other countries, you know, in Europe, Africa, the Middle East, or whatever. They're, they're seeking refuge, and they don't have time to learn English. So 
there right. has to be some kind of grace period to do it. All right, uh, and we'll go more into the immigration system, but really, uh, it seems like that kind of got stepped aside a little bit because of this exchange between uh, the CNN reporter uh, Acosta and uh, Miller. Just want to ask you, was Acosta's line of questioning, in your mind, appropriate and served to benefit the public, or was it too commentary, as some critics have suggested? No, I mean, Jim Acosta is a political... CNN hitman. He wants to create a reaction. He wants to make a name for himself. He's doing what Jeff Zucker, the head of CNN, wants him to do, which is to attack the Trump presidency. And I think that Steve Miller probably agrees with my position. In essence, he's a former Duke University alum. I mean, he's not that far right. He would have gone to some other school if he did. And But he was provoked, and he reacted to that. And the White House and uh, Jim Acosta of CNN absolutely hate each other, and I think that gave rise to this exchange. Did he re now, you said, and I'm just going back to what you said earlier, you said you thought both, uh, both performances weren't the best. Um, how would you grade Steve Miller's performance during that briefing? I think, uh, although I like Miller, I think he went over the top. I don't think he served the interests of, of Donald Trump at the time. He went too far. Uh, he did make a good point. Other people do speak English throughout the world. Mm -hmm. uh, even in China, they speak excellent English, the kids that are learning how to, to come up through the system. But you have to have a grace period to let people learn English. It's just not, it, that shouldn't be an absolute bar to coming to this country. And that's wrong. And I don't think the president believes that either. All right. Well, let's put Miller and Acosta aside. And there's been a lot of discussion, as you know, on the ramifications of this particular bill. Uh, the Washington Post claims that it would damage the nation's economy. It writes that immigrants actually help boost the economy and that cutting the number of legal immigrants roughly in half would deprive businesses of much needed labor. Now, the Post claims the U.S. needs immigrant labor to continue its economic growth as the U.S. birth rate hits new lows and baby boomers continue to retire. But the Post isn't alone. A number of Republicans, Larry, including Senator Jeff Flake and Lindsey Graham, have already spoken out against this bill, arguing the same defense. So I'm going to ask you, does this bill have the potential of hurting certain industries like agriculture? Well, I don't think so. I mean, people are not opposed, I don't believe, to bringing people in, to picking fruit, for instance, in California, Florida, elsewhere, as long as they're not here permanently and ultimately either become permanent residents, citizens, or leave. There is a need for these people. Generally speaking, Anglo people won't do it. Uh, and meatpacking plants are another example. My family was in the meatpacking industry uh, when I was growing up, and later Hispanics took over, you know, in terms of the workers there. So I don't think people are going to be that extreme about this thing. And I don't think that this bill in particular is going to significantly hurt the economy. But a foot has to be put down. You can't constantly allow all this immigration, bring people in, have them stay and not round them up and tell them to leave at a certain point. And that's what I think this bill is trying to get to. So I think it's an extreme position to say it's going to hurt the economy. But I do agree that you do need immigrants and you may need someday worker sites. They should be policed for illegal immigrants that they don't stay, they don't commit crimes, that kind of thing, to allow people to do the jobs that some Americans won't do. Now, Larry, going back to a point that you brought up, you were talking about English being a prerequisite. Uh, from my understanding, it, it isn't necessarily that you can't come into the country if you don't speak English. It's just that you kind of get above the line so to speak. There's more preference for you. Well, yeah, I think that's legitimate, okay? But the way the question was posed by Acosta to Miller, that's what I was responding right, to, right. not the actual immigration bill. I mean, they created a situation where the American people thought it was either or. It can't be either or. Uh, that would have excluded all of our relatives, our grandparents, great-grandparents, etc. We wouldn't have a country if that absolute rule was imposed. Now, many have suggested that this bill doesn't stand a chance of passing because, again, so many Republicans have voiced their opposition to it. Do you think that's true? And what would it take to convince them otherwise? Well, I don't think anything can pass in the Republican Congress these days. Ooh. I mean, you've got anything of significance because you've got this establishment Republican faction that deeply resents that President Trump won the election. It broke up their money chain. It broke up their power. They want him destroyed. 
Uh, John McCain is the leader of that. I feel bad about his brain tumor, but he's done a lot of damage to the Republican Party and to President Trump. They would like to see their own candidate run in 2020. And you can see that Jeb Bush down in my home state of Florida is maneuvering to do that right now. He's getting very critical of Trump. Uh, he thinks that somehow he's going to rise from the ashes. I don't think so. I think the American people are tired of people who think they have a right to be president. So uh, this is an effort by the establishment to destroy Trump in Congress. Uh, and frankly, they're not organized. They don't have leadership. And I'd be very surprised if anything of this magnitude passes. Oof, that's not very hopeful. Uh, is there anything the president can do, though? He can go to the people. He's got to go to the people. He's got to go out there. He's got to do more rallies. He's got to talk to them. He should have more sessions, you know, on TV with press conferences, go direct. As I've said before, Miranda, I think the president needs to go direct. Don't go through press secretaries. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, they're put on the spot. They have to wriggle out of that spot. Talk to the people yourself. People actually really like this president. I really like this president. I like that he says what he thinks. He makes some mistakes, but we all do. Uh, I think he has the interest of this country at heart, and the American people will learn to appreciate that if he goes to them direct. All right, I want to talk more about the claim that President Trump called the White House a dump. Uh, we talked about this in our headlines. A golf journalist published the remark as part of a story on the president's golf habits uh, in Sports Illustrated earlier this week. Now, he told Golf Magazine that at least eight people heard Trump make that comment. And Trump... Uh, you know, asked them, the White House did, to retract the story. He says no. Uh, the president was not happy about this report, as you might imagine. Now, he took to Twitter claiming, I love the White House, one of the most beautiful buildings, homes I have ever seen, but fake news said I called it a dump. Totally untrue. Even uh, Chelsea Clinton was chiming into this. So, uh, Larry, you're, you know, being the prosecutor, I'm going to use your legal brain here. Is there anything either side can do to prove that this story is fabricated or true? Well, let me use a little humor here. Maybe they don't have uh, domestic help in the White House anymore because they got rid of the illegal immigrants. Maybe it's messy. I don't know. Ooh. But, you know, to, to me, it's kind of stupid. You know, this is tongue in cheek. Okay. I'm I sure know. The I know. I know. Believe the White yeah, the White House is a dump. Okay. But I'll tell you something. I visited the White House on a number of occasions as a tourist and otherwise. It's a lot smaller than you think it is. Uh, and it has some really uh, bright colors in it. Maybe it's not Melania and uh, the Donald's preference for, uh, for furnishing. So I must say that I love the president. I don't think his taste in interior design is the best, but that's my opinion. So not enough gold there. It's not Mar-a-Lago-like. Uh, but you know, what do you do though when you're like the president and the White House and you're continuing uh, to have these whether it's you or members of your cabinet are having these heated exchanges with the media, how do you fight back? Is it, again, going and doing these rallies and going to Twitter? Well, do the rallies. Uh, I also suggested I think the president should go in front of Congress and answer questions directly. The more he's attacked, the more he's liked. I mean, he creates a certain sympathy factor. Right. And I think he should also do, uh, you know, fireside chats, even though it's the summertime. Uh, you can have a fake fire in the background. He can talk to the American people directly and, and say, here's what's at stake, guys and gals. You need to pull behind me. You may not have voted for me, but these are pressing issues and explain it to them because he's good at explaining these things at street level. And most people in this country don't want to hear this highfalutin stuff. They want to hear it at street level. And that's why he won. And I think he needs to do that. Don't go through Sarah Huckabee Sanders. She's really good. She's excellent. Other people are good too in the White House. But let's hear it from the horse's mouth. So no need for communications, that. director, as far as you're concerned. That should be the president. I, uh, go ahead. I really don't think so. I mean, you know, I don't agree with everything the Europeans do. I think they have done a lot of harm to their continent with the way they, they act over there. But the Europeans are smart. They don't let uh, press secretaries talk or prime ministers or presidents. Right. They talk directly, whether it's in England or in France or in Germany. You want to hear from the guy directly or gal. And now you uh, will tonight. We need tonight. to start doing it. Larry Kleeman, thanks so much for joining us. And you will hear from the president. Thanks, Miranda. At 7 o'clock tonight, he's holding a rally, and we're going to carry it live here on Newsmax TV.